This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey guys, Andrew here. Uh, Before the episode starts, I just wanted to say that my guest, Mike Spears, and I did not discuss any of the recent news regarding the Speaking Out movement. Um, If you're not aware of what that is by now, hopefully you are, but if you're not, a number of women have come forward who are involved in wrestling and they are sharing stories about being abused, sexually, physically, any sort of abuse, really. And there have been some very prominent wrestlers named in those stories. And when Mike and I sat down to record this episode on Saturday, new stories were emerging, you know, minute by minute, one after the other, pretty much nonstop. And it was all just so emotionally draining and depressing to look at. And I didn't feel like I was in the right headspace to discuss it on here. I felt like I needed some time to pass for me to really uh, process all the emotions that I'm feeling because of it and collect my thoughts better, too, uh, for a discussion. And a few weeks from now, on the next episode after this one, I am planning on discussing this in greater detail when I've had a chance to, like I said, uh, process it a lot better. Because I think this is something that, uh, you know, much like the Black Lives Matter protests, is just so massive that it needs to be discussed. And I have a platform to do that, so I will. And I imagine that many other wrestling podcasts out there, both VOW or otherwise, will do the same. So again, I just wanted to reassure you guys that we're not ignorant to what's going on out there. Uh, No one should be, of course. Like I said, I just need some time to gather my thoughts so I can discuss this as best I can. And I guess wrapping this whole thing up, it's undoubtedly a very depressing time to be a wrestling fan right now. But as depressing as it all is, again, much like with Black Lives Matter... It is also very inspiring to see these women come forward with their stories and not be afraid to tell them. And to all those victims out there, I commend your bravery so much in speaking out. And I stand with you 100%. So all that said, enjoy the episode. Uh, Trust me, from here on out, it's a lot funnier and a lot brighter. Uh, Mike is, you know, he's a fantastic guest, a great guy, and this is a really fun episode. And hopefully, if you're feeling overwhelmed by all the news out there, This will give you some respite from all that stuff. So, I love you guys. You're the best. And I'll see you around. One, two, one, two, three, five! To music of the mat on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 86, and it is Masters of Dragon Gate Volume 2. And returning from Volume 1 is a man with many tracksuits and many podcasts. He is one of the hosts of both Open the Voice Gate and Everything Elite, both of which are also part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. It's your old pal and mine, Iron Mike Spears. Hello, Mike. Hi, Andrew. I'm glad to be back talking some tracks here. You really have an interesting list of of theme songs for us to talk about this time, and I'm stoked to be back here talking about them. I'm glad you're back here as well. Yeah, of course, definitely. Um, how are you holding up with, uh, you know, the pandemic and such? Are you doing okay? You know, it's been interesting. I'm someone that, like, my day-to-day has not changed all that much, and I guess I'm I'm lucky in that fashion. But it's one of those things that, I at least over, like, the first few months of it, I, it's been something where it's like, oh, I can create more because I know that people are, were more likely to be working at home and quarantining in place. So it was really like a time of like expanding and doing a whole lot of new projects, including something with Open the Voice Gate with Case Low, where we're going back through DGUSA. But now four months in, it kind of gets to you. And, you, you know, other I, that there's luckily, it seems to be at least in Japan and in Dragon Gate, they're opening up. So I'll be real excited to start seeing some shows in front of real crowds soon. 
Yeah, I know New Japan just came back with the New Japan Cup in Empty Arena, and I'm not a huge fan of Empty Arena, of course, but it, still, it, it's pretty cool just to have these guys back in wrestling again after, you know, four months away. I miss them so much. And to know that, yeah, there is a light at the end of the tunnel here where New Japan can have fans again, you know, Dragon Gate can have fans again, DDT, Stardom, all these other promotions, um, you know, at least in Japan anyway. So it is cool that there is an avenue to having fans back at these shows, Mike. Oh, absolutely. I think it's having the light at the end of the tunnel that with with that is really helpful. And then with uh, Dragon Gate, this usually would be the big, the busiest time of the year. I think last year when we did this episode at Masters of Dragon Gate 1, it was right before Kobe World. But this year, everything's kind of in flux right now. But I, I'm glad we're moving back to some sense of normality, at least whatever normality might be nowadays in Dragon Gate. Right, right. Well, we are here on Masters of Dragon Gate Volume 2, and uh, since the last time you were on the show here, Mike, which was last year, there have been, you know, a few key changes in Dragon Gate. Uh, the biggest one, arguably, being Ultimo Dragon joining the company, which, you know, given the backstory of the company itself, it is pretty amazing because the whole reason that Dragon Gate exists at all is because of all those Toriumon guys splitting away from Ultimo Dragon and forming their own promotion. So... The fact that Ultimo is back with his boys and being part of the team after just years and years away, it's quite something, Mike. Yeah, it's easily the, after Ultimo splitting, it's easily the, the biggest moment in the history of the Dragon system is the return of Ultimo Dragon and him kind of returning into the fold in an official way. And it's definitely, as Dragon Gate now, as a part of is will be turning 21 this year. It's a way of, I, I like looking at things like as eras and as shifts of time, like this is like true adulthood for this promotion that in a lot of ways was a reaction, as you said, to Ultimo Dragon and then all the students forming their own thing. And now there's this nice feeling of reconciliation and family that's happening with Ultimo. And we get to have like his great Instagram photos. He's up there with Dr. Wagner Jr. as one of like the premier people on Instagram. So that that's another added benefit to all this. Oh yeah, he's sipping his drinks, he, he's dressed like a dapper gentleman, he, he's having a blast on Instagram, that's for sure, that's for sure. Um, the other big thing is that they also did this huge storyline shift where almost every unit disbanded and they're now doing a generational war between the Toriumon guys, the Dragon Gate Trueborns, and R.E.D., which of course is the heel unit that just hates everybody, which unfortunately means we lost some you know pretty great unit themes in the process. So no more first finger, no more blow him away, and uh, sadly no more party anthem, the natural vibes theme, which hurt me most of all, Mike, because you know how much I love that natural vibes theme. I, I mean, party anthem was one of those themes that with KZ and Brother Yashi both performing on it, it just was like such a nice event. And then like first finger was one of those themes that I felt like really embodied their unit so specifically that losing that hurts as well. And I also believe that the group that did First Finger 21G disbanded soon after that as well. So who knows if there would be ever be anything like that. And then blow them away. I, I I have a very kind of a hit or miss like opinion of blow them away. I initially really liked it. Then I hated it. And now I'm back to missing it. <laughs> it because it's very much was like, did you, this game might be before your time, but did you ever really play any of these Sonic Adventure games? Uh, Not really, no. It was very much like a Sonic Adventure, like early 2000s, like background music theme that like it fit in very well in like the pop punk vibe. But we, we lost all of that. We're, and now, sadly, with the unit themes, we are getting episodes as Toriumon Guns theme, which is a takeoff of the original theme that they used for the Toriumon TV show. And then new versions of Dragon Storm for the Trueborns and then... R.E.D.'s theme, which, I mean, is still, I think, one of the uh, better themes that they've put together in a long time. I'm glad that they've stuck with that. Well, I do know one guy who is pretty happy that there's no more Natural Vibes theme. Susumu. Because he doesn't <laughs> have to dance to it anymore, you know? So. Oh, Susumu. You're right. Uh, poor guy. He's always in dancing units. And he uh, and it's someone that, like, you get people who are bad dancers but are enthusiastic bad dancers. And then you'll get people who are bad dancers and would rather be at the dentist. And that's Susumu Yokosuka, sadly. <laughs> Well, a, a couple more changes here. Uh, there's the new logo, which is this, you know, scary-looking dragon face. Makes sense, I think. And also a slight name tweak from Dragon Gate two words 
to just Dragon Gate one word. And, you know, Mike, as a wrestling fan, I've accepted a lot of name changes over the years. But this is one that, for whatever reason, I just I can't get used to it. I mean, it's not right to me to see Dragon Gate spelled out as just one word. And I don't know if I'll ever get used to it, really. I mean, the thing that really kind of grinds my gears about this is after a while, your phone has your your autocorrect set up and having to retrain my phone to not automatically <laughs> like complete uh, dragging it and have it one word has been something to get used to. And it, it, it's something where I, we've started to see, it, especially with like the new logo, the way they've stylized things, we've started to see the start of new belts that probably if this was a normal year, we, we, we would be like complete, a complete uh, visual shift and everything. But with how everything is, it's kind of like halfway there, halfway not. And it's just something that I feel like that the name and the logos really sticks out to you because it's not completely coherent yet. Well, I think as an act of rebellion, I'll still use the old name when I title the podcast, just to just to stick it to them, you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you don't want to ruin your SEO. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, take that, you sushi conda. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, let's get to these themes here. And um, last time for Volume 1, I made a point to seek out the real heavy hitters of Dragon Gate that weren't already covered yet. You know, Shima, Doi, Yoshino, Dragon Kid, guys like that. This time around, I don't necessarily have that luxury anymore. So instead, I went for a mix of the veteran guys who have been around forever, a few foreign talent who really made their bones in the company, and some newer guys who will be the stars of Dragon Gate in the years to come. And compared to the previous list, yeah, it's not the same in terms of star power, sure. But still, Mike, I think we've got a good variety of guys to talk about here. Yeah, we were talking a little bit off air. We get, like, this real, like, era shift that's also represented in the company right now with some of the people you've chose with bands that weren't house bands, but bands they used a lot to how things are now. And then with the foreign talent, with the guy that you have listed here, you have your own thing as well. It's a real interesting sampling platter we have here. Right. So let's get into it now with our first wrestler. Uh, he is one of the young guns who is part of the next generation of talent. It's Ben K, who is a former Dreamgate champion and currently one third of the Triangle Gate champions. And Ben K's theme is by an artist named Tusk. And it's called Oriental Weapon. So this is a mix between the traditional East Asian instrumentation found in a lot of Japanese wrestling themes with the flutes and the strings and the more modern rock metal instrumentation. Uh, we've, we've seen it before many times, of course. It's meant to symbolize that this guy has an old school warrior mentality in the body of a modern day wrestler. And, and that's Ben K to a T. I mean, he is a no-nonsense guy who is a power wrestler, he's built like a brick fucking shithouse, especially now, where he's put on, like, what, so much more muscle there, Mike. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild, you know. Uh, to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's more meat than man now. So this song just, it fits him so well, Mike. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, he is the leader of a group that I've started to call the Bulk Club because <laughs> somehow a lot of these people of the Trueborn and the uh, Dragon Gate Army, the people who are from, like, the most recent classes really have gotten into quarantine where they're at the dojo, they work out all the time, they can't really leave the dojo, and they just decided to, to just get big. And Binke is the leader of this. I believe he's gained upwards 
of 30 pounds over the last Oof. few months. And, and it's one of those things where it's almost to the point of that he's, like, bursting. Like, when someone has so much muscle on their frame, they're like, that guy is impressive. And, it, and, and like, this theme is a very bursting theme. So I, I think, like, out of everyone, and yeah, you made a really good point about the idea of all the... Uh, Asian instrumentation, which fits in with his name as well, that it's just like a very awesome, complete package. And it, it, it's something that when this theme was introduced, I believe it was early 2018, the first version of this thing came out. And it was like one of those things that made everyone kind of sit up and take notice because for a long time, it would be a while before people got their real themes. And then you had like this very boisterous theme for Benke that I think fits him so well. And it really kind of announced his presence, I would feel like, to the audience. Right, and you know, a lot of Dragon Gate themes that we've talked about before, and we'll cover today as well, later on, they're just so synth-heavy, they're so bright, they're so colorful, and they have these you know sentimental, emotional vocals and lyrics that, that fill you with hope and, and love and desire. <laughs> Not this one, you know, this is oomph, this is rage and aggression. Uh, the, the title speaks to that as well. You know, when you've got a title with weapon in it, I think it has to have some, uh, you know, some oomph to it, some impact to it. And I think the wrestler needs to be that as well. And, and Ben K certainly fits the bill with his ring style. And that's evident with the lyrics too. You know, the scant lyrics that we do get here are either a series of loud shouts like, I, 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 or Ben K crush go. Ben K. Crush, go! You know, this is not Dragon Storm 2007. Unlimited possibilities in their hearts, like a gemstone of sparkling diamonds. N n none of that stuff, all right? Ben K., his nickname is the Soul Shouter. So you bet your ass his theme is just going to be, you know, shouting, Mike. <laughs> yeah, and it all kind of fits together that he has, like, this almost chanting lyrics in his theme. They has very bolsterous instrumentation. And then as well, you have the whole idea of using the Asian musical instruments with someone who's named Benke, which is something that I always find really kind of cool is he's named after a Japanese folk hero that was known for like being such like an incredible swordsman and monk that, and like faithful in a way that he was his goal was to basically defeat a thousand people in duels and connect and collect their swords. And Benke is one of the few wrestlers I think could probably carry a thousand swords, so it all fits. <laughs> when I was listening to this, it reminded me a lot of Shingo's theme, Legend Falconry. Oh, sure. You know, that, that same blend of the classic Asian music with the modern heavy stuff. And the similarities between the two guys don't end there, of course. You know, Shingo was the beef boy of Dragon Gate for many years, and now that he's in New Japan... Ben K has stepped up and assumed that role. And I think given Ben K's output so far and given his success so far, just a few years into his career, I think much like with Shingo Takagi, he'll be a big name in Dragon Gate for many years to come, Mike. Oh yeah, no, I mean, the uh, the comp you, you would clearly put on Ben K, especially if you're someone who's not familiar with the Dragon Gate wrestling itself. If you've seen Shingo Takagi, he's very, there's very similar things. They are both kind of what what people would call power juniors, but I don't know if you can call someone 115 kilos now a power <laughs> junior or the same Shingo Takagi now in New Japan. But there's a lot of similarities there, and it's very kind of fitting that when Dragon Gate launched, uh, when they split from Ultimo and Torban Japan and launched Dragon Gate, the first big student coming out of the school and the first debutee was Shingo Takagi. And then with all these things that have gone around in a very turbulent two years in Dragon Gate, it's very obvious that like Benke has been someone at the forefront, and there's a lot of similarities between the two. It's a very apt comparison. So our second wrestler here is also one-third of the Triangle Gate champions with Benke. It is Dragon Daya, and Dragon Daya is one of the younger guys on the roster at 21 years old. His theme is by Koshino Shioko, and it's called Infinite Carrot Diamond. Dragon Daya! Yeah. 
the Daya in Dragon Daya is, I presume, short for diamond. Right. And there are references to diamonds all over the song and the lyrics and the title, which we'll get to in a second here. But the music is, like I said, part of that you know iconic Dragon Gate sound with the bright, hopeful, um, no pun intended, sparkly synth rock music. Uh, the emotional vocals, it evokes the music of Dragon Storm 07, the first BB Story theme, uh, you know, Anthony W. Morey's theme, Kineska, songs like that. And it especially evokes a certain theme song that we covered last time, Mike, on Volume 1, because I'm listening to it, and I hear the tune of the melody, and it is pretty, 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 pretty similar to the Dragon Kid theme, Jamais Vu. <laughs> and, you know, considering that Dragon Daya is the protege of Dragon Kid, I'd say those dots are pretty easy to connect there, Mike. <laughs> it, it, I mean, that the, they lay it out there for it as well. He, from, the, from his debut, he's been intrinsically linked to his mentor, Dragon Kid. I think there's a clear idea that when we've talked about like, the generation changing and the idea of this true-born gun, the Dragon Gate army... He is the dragon of that thing, and and the dragon's symbolism is so important in the company, and as we're seeing, a lot of the original generation wrestlers are in their 40s, and, you know, as, as much as we want them to stay around forever, that there is a realistic thing that we're looking at, perhaps, like, the final decade or less of some of these wrestlers. Like, having someone like Daya, who has this very inspirational kind of look, look in the same way, like, that Dragon Gate loves the symbolism of of diamonds they've used it throughout the promotion and including people like you've you've introduced like bb hulk like he was someone that has had diamond idea uh, imagery throughout it as well but this is a very much like a superhero styled theme song that you could almost see someone like setting up like dragon diet going and like saw saving a robbery or like helping someone <laughs> out who's been mugged and this song plays in the background it, it, it's very much almost like an anime theme in a lot of ways of like this young hero that's learning his way and that's very similar to how his how his career has been at least for the last for he's only he will be officially in his third year in october so i mean he's still incredibly young i mean as you mentioned 21 debuted at 19 was not training super long before he debuted so it, it's just one of those things that i think is fine very remarkable and a very complete package with dragon Daya. yeah and, and who knows where his career will go who knows if he'll still be dragon Daya, you know five ten years from now but Right now, that's who he is, and they're going to hammer home that connection to Dragon Kid very hard, including with the song. Um, I mean, I mean it's, it's no different than Charlotte Flair coming out to a song based on Ric Flair's theme, or Curtis Axel coming out to a song based on the Mr. Perfect theme. You know, and, and yeah, Daya and Kid are not related, of course, but still, the idea of the lineage and setting up that next generation in line. And in Daya, he's got the dragon name, the dragon mask... The Hurricane Rana based finishing moves, and even the tie in to the old Dragon Kid stable, Dia Hearts. So it just makes sense then that his theme song also has a deep connection to Dragon Kid, Mike. Oh, absolutely. And then you look at like lyrics and the theme, such as like never, never ending cheer, stand up to me to change the future, you're the hero. It's very similar to that, like how things were set up and, and it was portrayed for Dragon Kid. So you have this lineage and it's something that uh, my co-host of Open the Voice Gate and I, K-Slow, always kind of go back and forth about because being a dragon in Dragon Gate and in, within the dragon system is such a big deal that having this new generation version where like you've had Ultimo Dragon, you had his protege Dragon Kid. And now you have the second generation protege of Ultimo Dragon and the, the primary protege of Dragon Kid as Dragon Die is such a huge theme that it fits like so across the, the board for it. And it's something that symbolizing that with a diamond, like the idea of like the unlimited potential of a diamond is something that is so like close to Dragon Kid, close to a lot of like the, the young baby face wrestlers in Dragon Gate when they're introduced that it's, it fits across all it fits across the board. Yeah, and, and lyrically, you bring up Jamais Vu. I think the lyrical message of that song is not a complete one-to-one -one match with this one, but overall, there is still that same tone of wonderment, you know, that, that, that same flavor of optimism and heroism, and, and yeah, that potential for great things. Um, this is from Google Translate, so uh, not perfect by any stretch here, but uh, Infinite Carrot, Bring the Radiance of Love, Enchant Your Charm, Dazzling Light Fire... 
Uh, like you said, Mike, never ends cheers. Stand up, me to change the future. You are a hero. There's hope. There's radiance. A bright future ahead. And that's what every young upstart dreams of. You know, they dream about being the big hero someday and fulfilling their potential and shining brightly, which, again, also fits the vibrant, colorful world of Dragon Gate so well, Mike. Oh, absolutely. And it's one of those things that the the big, I think, core about this is like the potential for greatness. Like you, you look like look at the lyrics like uh, about like res- like the hot gun resounding victory a- aimed do it the instinct of a popular mystery grab heart is all kind of like that's all machine translated, but it all like fits in as like the this guy who twenty one years old he is someone that according to people within the company like the the, the whole thing about potential is really like evident there like there's talk about like oh you you've seen some moves that Hio de vikingo does oh they, they, they will say like oh dragon diet does them he does them better and it's just like such like a potential like thing of like this is going to be like one of their huge stars and this and this thing will be interesting to like track this theme and like his character as he gets older being such a young wrestler because the, this one is like such full of potential and now we're starting to see him actualize on that and it'll be exciting to see like both how the like the train the theme the symbolism and just how he evolves over like the first five years into like his first 10 years of his career i mean the song is called infinite Kara diamond you know infinite kind of says it all right there i think um uh, by the way um i heard a rumor through the grapevine okay that dragon gate is gonna bring in grizzly redwood to team up with dragon dia and I heard as well that the team is going to be called Dialogue. Folks! <laughs> I did not see that one coming that way. There we go, baby. Wrap this bad boy up. We are done for the day. <laughs> that, 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 was a, that was a hard left. I thought you were going to go with like chopping down something down or like sharpening things. But Dialogue did not see that coming. Well done. Look, it was either that pun or a Dragon Dia Rhea Ripley pun. All right, you do the math there. All right? Oh Come yeah, on. You, 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 you went the classy road. Oh, the classy of course. Road. Yeah, we are nothing if not a classy podcast here <laughs> on Music of the Mad. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, up next is a guy who came to Dragon Gate as a foreigner through Dragon Gate USA and really became one of, if not the most prolific foreigner that they ever had, uh, winning all four of their major titles winning the King of Gate tournament, and really seeing his stock rise just tremendously because of it. It's Ricochet, who is currently wrestling on WWE's illustrious program, Main Event. Uh, uh. <sighs> Check your local listings. Ricochet's theme is by a band named Teenage Rehab, and it's called White Ghetto. <laughs> It's a nice day for a white ghetto. Sorry, sorry, could have got myself there. Sorry. Uh, This is one of the simpler DG themes around, I think. Uh, Nothing really fancy or fantastical about it at all. It's just a a down and dirty punk song. Similar, I found, to Shima's Magusta Cola theme. And Ricochet and Shima were, of course, tag partners as the Spike Mohicans back in the day. So a nice little tie in there. And Ricochet has also used other heavy slash punk bands in the past, like Pantera, Rise Against, The Pixies. So there is a pattern there with the kind of music that he's used in his career. And as well, both Ricochet and Teenage Rehab are from Paducah, Kentucky. And I found a Facebook post from Teenage Rehab back in 2011, which says, Ricochet from Dragon Gate Pro Wrestling will be using White Ghetto for his entrance music going down to the ring. As a huge wrestling fan and good friend of Ricochet, 
I'm very excited about this. Dragon Gate Pro Wrestling Japan and DG USA are great independent promotions with amazing talent. And it's signed by Alex Reject, who is the drummer of the band. So there are just so many connections for Ricochet to come out to this song, Mike. Yeah, and I did not know the thing about that he was friends with the band. I knew that they were both were from Paducah, Kentucky. But it it's something that basically he used this theme into his time in New Japan. Like he, the, this kind of became his Japanese theme, although I know that there were other themes that he had later on in his New Japan tenure. And w- when this theme like came out, as you mentioned, like they announced it like 2011, it was such a big like change for him and like how he grew within Dragon Gate. So, like, the idea that he would usually come out to unit themes as most uh, Gaijin and younger wrestlers do, they usually don't get themes immediately. But, like, him, like, coming out with this, and especially, like, as a part of the big feud that he was a part of at the time, the big Blood Warriors versus Junction 3 feud, it really kind of put him on the map, and it would kind of, like, signify, like, a period of change that of a guy who walked into Dragon Gate basically because Shima saw a YouTube video of him doing the double <laughs> moonsault, and he said... Hey Gabe, I want to see him do this in front of the ring, and then basically becoming Shima's American protege and how they're so linked. Like having something that's so similar to, to Mika Sakola, and then like the fact that whenever like he would come back to Dragon Gate, especially on that last tour, he would come with the old Spike Mohican gear, which definitely was someone who we talked about the Bolt Club earlier. Definitely was like wearing a, a set of gear that was made for someone who's forty pounds lighter than he was at the time. <laughs> But no, this is like such a cool theme, and it's something that I, I think it's really kind of awesome that the, he was able to like have this friendship with a, someone who's in a band that I did not know that Teenage Rehab has been going for like 20, 25 years, and like being able to pull that in and make it part of his character, I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, having said all of that, uh, I, I will note that this is... Uh... This is a pretty depressing song, I think, Mike. I mean, the lyrics are just so dark. I've been waiting so patiently, so patiently, been this way forever more. I've been having the bad dreams at night when I sleep. I was born into poverty, a trailer park, white ghetto forevermore. It's like the whole song is about how this guy is just born into a shit life. He'll be in that shit life forever. Everything just sucks. Ricochet, everybody! The future of flight! I mean, it's it's definitely a strange contrast between the high-flying, amazing Ricochet and this dark, dark song, Mike. Yeah, it it might be one of the heaviest songs that's ever been played in Dragon Gate. I mean, th- this isn't uh, Apollo Crews, formerly known as Uha Nation, coming out to the Genghis Khan here. Yeah. <laughs> It would, this isn't even really when, like, Ronin Baby with, like, Rich Swan. This is a pretty, like, dark song, and I don't know if it's something where he picked the song because it represented part of, like, growing up in Paducah, Kentucky, and, like, things he saw and like, him rising above that. But just, like, having a song talking about meth addiction, walking into Kobe Kennan Hall is definitely something that makes you kind of, like, arch your eyebrow up and go, like, okay, this is... It's something where, like, you wonder if they go through all the lyrics and they know what's going on there. Right, yeah. I mean, to be, fa- to be fair, uh, <laughs> Ricochet, he, he hasn't always been the I'm a superhero guy, you know? Yeah, there was the time where... He was still the young heel in Blood Warriors, sure, but at the same time, he started using White Ghetto towards the end of that Blood Warriors run in 2011-2012, and he kept using it as a face theme afterwards for many, many years until his last DG match in 2017, which includes winning King of Gate, and includes being both the Dream Gate champion and the Freedom Gate champion at the same time, by the way. It's like Ricochet, buddy... Things are looking up for you here, all right? <laughs> You're doing pretty damn well at the moment. Come on. Well, well like, there was the story that when he came for his farewell tour, because he went, and it was one of those things that everyone was like, yeah, he's going to go do New Japan, and that's a fine thing. But he wanted to come back before he finally signed the WWE deal because he wanted to say goodbye. And it, it, it's not unfair to say that the step between Dragon Gate and New Japan is much of a bigger step than between if someone was to go from All Elite Wrestling to WWE. Like, there's a big, like, perception shift, and there's a big, just, like, popularity shift. And they're like, oh, we'll get you set up. Like, we'll love for you to come in. We'll get your, your hotel set up, and you'll be able to do this. And he said, no, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to stay in the dojo. Make sure my bunk is free. 
And it's just something that like shows like him keeping this theme and him keeping this for so long that it's just very much like reminiscent of someone who, for lack of better words, went from being a teenager into being a full fledged adult and becoming one of like becoming the most decorated gaijin in Dragon Gate history at the time. I mean, the fact that he was the first gaijin to win King of Gate, first gaijin ever to win the Open the Dream Gate title. When that happened, I distinctly remember the next day pulling up the Figure Four Weekly website, Andrew. And right on the front page, and the main thing is, was Ricochet with both the belts. And that never happened before in Dragon Gate. So it's just such like a thing of like seeing this guy who's used this thing for so long that it's very hard for me. And it was always very hard for me to like see him in Lucha Underground and the very small bits of WWE that I've seen over the last few years. Seeing him and have him not coming out with, especially with the very like great singer of, of the dun 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 and then the drums kicking in. It just, it, it, it it's it's a theme that for how heavy it is and how it's kind of out of uh, sync in some ways with the overall like Dragon Gate music, it he personifies it, and it's very hard for me to detach him from that. Well, that period of time where he was Dream Gate champion and Freedom Gate champion, don't forget around the same time he also won Best of the Super Juniors. He won Bola. 2014 was a real landmark year for him, where he took that big step up to a new level. And when you reach a certain level, yeah, you do need to grow up and get a good head on your shoulders because otherwise you might crash and burn. And I think since 2014, Ricochet has grown up even more so. And, you know, wrestling on main event or not, I think Ricochet is someone who you can put him in any major company on earth and give him the ball and he'll handle it really well, Mike. It's something with him that unlike other wrestlers who've gone... I've always expected that he was going to be in WWE. He seemed like that this was a phase in his life. And it's not like I look at his career as wistfully as I do with like your Uha nations, especially for me, your Kira Tozawa's. It's something where like you, you see how it is. And I mean, he's someone that was so devoted to this. And yes, it was a phase, but it was a phase so important to him that he went. And I don't know if he's covered it up since, but he got the original Dragon Gate dragon tattooed on his elbow. So it's not left him, but I mean, he really was kind of the banner waver, at least towards Western audiences with Dragon Gate. Well, uh, so far, Mike, this has been, you know, a pretty clean show in terms of the wrestlers featured. But um, I think now it's time to grind things up a bit, shall we? Let's let's dirty up the works with this next one here, because this is Gamma. And uh, remind me, Mike, is Gamma still your 2020 wrestler of the year? Well, let me turn to my whiteboard. Yes, it still has Gamma 2020 wrestler of the year. Oh, good, good. Well, uh, we still have six more months to go in the year, so uh, let's see if he can hold on to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gamma, a longtime veteran of Dragon Gate since he hopped over from Osaka Pro Wrestling in 06. And his theme song is by a Dragon Gate music stalwart, Yohei, featuring Aki. It's called Shout at the Brain. <laughs> Much like a pomegranate, this song is pretty damn seedy. It fits so I mean, well. when a song starts with an uh grunt, that's the tip-off right there. <laughs> Not to mention the one that comes later on, too. Um, and you've got, of course, the dark, sinister synths a la Kness's theme, another grimy boy. The metal music, which isn't happy, fun-time Van Halen metal. It's pretty dark and dingy as well. And the vocals, which are processed vocals, they've been modified to be grimy too and have that filter on them that sounds like they're singing through a barrier. And the Google Translate lyrics are just total nonsense to me as well. So overall, this is not a clean-sounding song at all, Mike. But hey, listen, this is Gamma, 
and clean and gamma usually do not go together at all, Mike. So that makes sense. I mean, he's not had to wrestle in front of crowds for a while, but he is the one person that I know who does probably as much spitting and gargling moves as possible. So he is quite literally one of the grimiest wrestlers in the world. For a long time, Andrew, his nickname was your local third-rate indie wrestler. <laughs> and it's very fitting for him, as is this theme. Like, I wouldn't... It, it's very hard for, like, seeing some wrestlers get away from certain themes, and especially with how, how Gamma came into Dragon Gate and where he came from and, like, the character he portrayed there. Like, even though, like, that's nearly 15 years ago, it fits him still to this day so well. I mean, he's still going to, like spit on his hands and rub it in someone's face. He's going to get up on the turnbuckle, gargle water and spit on someone. Don't know if he's going to be doing it anymore now, but it's just something that's part of his character so much that it's so fitting that his theme would be like, would be like shout at the brain. Like it's so connected to him at this point. But you know what? As grimy as it all is, it's pretty damn catchy too. I I like this song quite a bit. I think I, I love the groove of the rhythm section. I think some of the vocal melodies are pretty cool too. And, you know, yeah, in the pantheon of Dragon Gate themes, I don't think this is one that people look at as a legendary theme song, sure. But I think it's still pretty fun in its own right, Mike. Oh, absolutely. If this is going to be on one of their multiple DVD sets, it's not going to be on your first disc. It's probably not going to be on your second disc. But it's very kind of similar to the themes that Yohei has done for Dragon Gate before, where it does have kind of like the driving groove. And it's something that other themes for units that Gamma's been in by Yohei have had a very similar groove. Of. And it's just like a nice, just in a, in a lot of ways, a nice like montage and mosaic that they have going with him. It's like Gamma himself, you know, he's not going to be considered a legendary DG wrestler by, I think, most sensible people, but he's had his moments now and again. Um, I mean, you don't become Mike Spears' wrestler of the year otherwise, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> There's something about him that, like, like Dollars and Donuts, he's not going to be in any sort of my uh, lo- like career-wide reign of, like, top wrestlers, but he has his charms. He going through DGUSA on Open the Voice Gate, when they've brought him over for the WrestleMania weekend in 2020 in Phoenix, and he becomes the most popular person in Phoenix in the <laughs> venues. Like, there's a certain charm, there's a certain, like, chutzpah to him that it's very kind of hard to get away from, especially for someone that, I mean, never won the Dream Gate. He probably never will. He won the Brave Gate once and then turned it into Open the Gamma Gate. And then just has been someone that, like, He's most known for his tag team with Shima and Osaka Zenroke and then his various Triangle Gate teams. He's had 13 Triangle Gate teams across almost 15 years. Like he's very much like someone that is very much interwoven to the thread of Dragon Gate. And I'm happy that he's had such a great 2020 where he's just been someone that just seems to have like a little bit of a fire underneath him. Like he's staying out of this war because he's not a member of the Dragon System. He's, as you said, an Osaka pro guy who was traded by Super Delphin. But he, he, when he interjects himself in like teams with like Masaki Mochizuki, it, it kind of gives a little pep to his step. And I'm happy to see that for someone who's almost 50, which is kind of wild to think. And you need guys like that too. You know, you need, as, as Joe Lanza would say, the good solid veteran hands. You know, they're not going to be match of the year machines like Mochizuki or Shingo or guys like that. But they'll give you a good standard performance almost every time out, which is what you want in your roster. Everyone needs ditch diggers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, uh, Shout of the Brain, it's also one of those songs where there's like 10 different versions of it, you know? <laughs> there, There's the 08 version, uh, 2010, 2012, 2016. Um, I believe this is the 2012 version, but um, that's another Dragon Gate staple, of course, which is the multiple remixes and the multiple versions of themes, which is actually a good thing because it's evidence of longevity in a company, Mike. Yeah, and you're you're evolving a lot. I mean, Gamma came in as like this this foil to Shima, and then became like as Shima joked around called him his best partner, and then he's gotten away from it, of course, nowadays. And it's one of those things that having these evolutions of his theme like is a testament to his longevity and the evolutions he's had. And going back to some of the wrestlers talked about before, we've already seen some like evolutions. Like I believe there are other than the big match theme, there are three different versions of, of Oriental Wrestling or Oriental Weapon for Benkei right now. So having these like evolutions of your themes, like there's so many different BB stories that I feel like it should be its own encyclopedia at this point. Right. <laughs> but it, it, it tells you like longevity in a lot of ways. Like you become very beloved by Dragon Gate fans for like being around so long. And Gamma is someone who's come from seeding backgrounds and still 
he he's definitely someone that he might know where to bury a body, but he but he's our guy that buries bodies. <laughs> Well, uh, we go from one grimy bastard to another here, uh, not just for his look or ring gear, but also for his Twitter photos, which Mike has saved on his phone. Of course, I'm referring to Big R Shimizu, a member of R.E.D. This song is by our old buddy Akma, love the Akma, and it's called Big Resistance, all caps. Big R, big R, big R. Mike, the amount of times that I found myself walking around my apartment going big R, (laughs) big R to myself is upsettingly high. I mean, this song just got stuck in my head ad nauseum. And it's not even like the music itself is catchy. You know, it's rather straightforward and serious and militaristic with the rat tat drumming and the strings, but man, that big R vocal just, it would not leave my brain, Mike. <laughs> it, it's something like you have the big R vocals going. I always have the lead up to the big crescendo where he just goes, Rawr! Rawr! that gets stuck in my head. And it, it perfectly embodies like the, 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 the beefy boy, like one half of the uh, big Ben, which he was a, a longtime partner with, with Ben K. Like it's very suitable that these two big boys, these big slabs of meat have like this very no nonsense, very kind of just chanting, droning theme. And for, for Big R Shimizu, who I just, just as a person and as something like Big R Shimizu has the best social media accounts because it's a <laughs> lot of him just like just being really weird. Like my, well, like I do post a lot of the photos as you mentioned, and you post one of my favorite photos of him eating an ice cream cone in a bed and hotel wearing a house robe. But my favorite one is where he's sitting underneath a tree, staring off to the distance, just pondering. Something. Oh, I saw that one too. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's it's something that like I I don't necessarily know what he's pondering, and I don't think he's like figuring out like nuclear fission here. But it, it, it's it's very fitting for him as like. A man of just many sides to have a theme that is very proud about himself. Right, yeah, like in my notes, as you said, very much like the Ben K theme, uh, Ben K, former tag partner of Big R Shimizu, it's a song that's meant to convey power and might. Maybe not as in-your-face and aggressive as Ben K's super shouty theme is, but still, it's a militaristic song, and what is the military but a big, powerful, imposing force? The song is called Big Resistance, and it's especially effective when the wrestler himself is meant to be an imposing force. Like, Goldberg coming out to his music makes that song extra intimidating. Big R Shimizu coming out to this song as a big, thick brute of a man with a crazy shot put slam has the same effect. It's going to make that song seem even more powerful and imposing, Mike. And it's something not to speak ill of, of a guy... He's known as being kind of a little bit of a dunderhead at times, like having a theme that's this like uncomplicated kind of fits for him in a way. Like uh, I, as I said, I don't think he's figuring out a nuclear fission around here, but him having something that lets him do, is like this powerful and like this, and especially for someone like him who was a like the shot put slams based off of something that the. Uh, Dragon Gate Network has the series called Prime Zone, which is like its own version of studio wrestling. But they used to have they used to have them like explain their themes. And one of the big things about the shot put slam and why it was called that was at one time he was a nationally ranked high school shot putter. So like he's a big forceful person, and it's very fitting for him. They have such a forceful theme. And I know this is an older version of Big Resistance because the one he has now in Red has like a nasty slime ball guitar in the mix. Which fits because, you know, 
big R.E.D. Shimizu is a total slimeball, Mike. I mean, not just with the photos, of course, but with the slick blonde hair, the, uh, oh, I love it so much, the Harlem Heat slash big sexy Kevin Nash red singlet with the open front <laughs> so his belly hangs out. I mean, he went from being this nice, sweet, thick boy in Maximum to eating ice cream in a hotel room with just a robe and sunglasses on. <laughs> It's been a slippery slope, Mike. You can't deny it. it. It's something that if you hang around Ada for too long, you just really kind of embrace the sleaze. And I mean, it, it, it's kind of fitting that his tag team partner was, was Binke, who, when he joined R.E.D. and do it, went down the heel path, like, he did not talk much. But the thing was, like, with Shimizu, maybe he's talked a little bit too much. He He's now kind of known for just being this big, sleazy goofball. His favorite wrestler's are Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. So him having the outsiders kind of color scheme fits him so well. And then the blonde hair is something that, you, you, you know, I, I know that like Rich Craig and Joe Lanza are like, how can we take this guy seriously now? He looks so shindy. It's like, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point that he is this kind of ridiculous of a person. So I, I think it's all fitting. And it's one of those things that makes me enjoy him as both a wrestler and a person even more. Yeah, uh, take Mr. Gonosuke and Kevin Nash Put them in a blender, and you get Big Arshimizu. <laughs> oh, dead on, dead on, yeah. Could be their long-lost nephew. Right, right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's cleanse the palate a little here, okay? Let's let's not get too grammy on this one. Uh, we'll move on to our next wrestler, and it's another long, long, long-time Dragon Gate veteran who was around back in the Toriyaman days, uh, first as Saito, and then later on, under the uh, much longer-lasting and much more well-known gimmick as Super Shisa. Uh, Shisa, not around too much in Dragon Gate these days because of his age. And um, does he still run that restaurant, Mike? It, it sadly closed down. Oh, he, no. He, he used to have a taco shop in, in his hometown. But it sadly shut down. Uh, he's back now doing more. He is part of the office now. So that's another reason why he's not wrestling as much. He's still, he, he still pops up time to time and always... Puts a smile on my face when I get to see Super Shisa get along and show what he does in the ring. Well, uh, regardless, uh, his theme song is by Yoji Kubota, and it's called, appropriately, Shisa Colin. <laughs> say mike this might be one of the sweetest nicest wrestling themes i've ever heard i mean it's just it's so pleasant and pop rock and fun reminds me of like a saturday morning cartoon show theme in a way with the upbeat music and the tones and especially with the sing-along she's a she's a part and i think that works for she's in particular because he wears that fluffy mask reminiscent of another cartoon character tiger mask He's a much uh, lighter character than a lot of the other aggressive wrestlers on the roster, which is reflected in his wrestling style as well. Uh, so, she's a Colin, not a headbanger of a theme, I'll grant you that, but still one that fits Super Shisa quite well, Mike. Oh, absolutely. And you did take my note. I was going to say this is the perfect Saturday morning cartoon theme song. Like, I had it <laughs> written down because it's so pleasant, and it, it's something that for someone like him, that he does wrestle more of a traditional uh a style of wrestling in Lucha Libre that's called Yave. He's a Yaveo. He's someone who does a lot of holds, a lot of submissions, and it's something that he's kind of made his own, and you mentioned his mask. His 
it, it's interesting that Dragon Gate likes to have certain characters represent certain parts of the country, and his mask and of Super Shisa is related to the uh, the Ryukyu Islands in Japan. Like the like it's like the ancient spirit. It's like supposed to be like the mythical animal that helped protect that area. So him having very charming theme fits that as well, especially as someone who somehow managed to uh, invent a move at the exact same time as as Amazing Red <laughs> with no interaction whatsoever. They both came up with the Code Red or the Yoshi Tonic, which is something that I always find remarkable. And the Yoshi Tonic is referenced in the song here. You know, I think this song is the one that, out of all the other ones on this episode, it's the most, like, on-the-nose, quote-unquote, wrestling theme because it references wrestling moves. Yeah, the Yoshi Tonic, uh, the Moonsault, the Saito Special, the Cobra, Top Rope Jumping. So it's very on-brand for a song specifically about a pro wrestler. Uh, but it also has that typical, you know, flowery mumbo-jumbo in there as well. Uh, white Whirlwind, Crimson Flame, Spirit That Burns in the Light, The Soul That Burns When You Hold It. Uh, again, anime TV theme lyrics right there. So it manages to handle both sides of that coin as opposed to going just one way or the other, Mike. Yeah, yeah. And it's something that in, in a lot of ways that has very kind of like flowerly and like protective lyrics that fits like being representing supposed to be like the protective spirit of an of the part of the country so i feel like it, it all kind of fits together like he mentions his moves in, in kind of a weird way like bringing up the yoshi tonic as you mentioned it, it fits him and, and that's something that at least with like the selection of songs here except for one that we, that when we get to i'll point it out this is a song that incredibly fits him as, as are the other five that we've talked about so far right right um i will note that there was a little confusion at first on my part over the title because I went to look up the song to put it in the episode here, and a lot of websites have the title listed as Caesar Colin, S-I-E-S-A-R, and it confused the hell out of me at first because <laughs> I was like, is there some ancient Roman wrestler I'm not aware of? It w was Brutus Magnus ever in Dragon Gate? And then I realized, oh, okay, it's probably just a translation slash pronunciation snafu, you know, Shisa, Caesar, so... It took me a second to really, you know, make sure I had the right song there. Just a little side story there for you, Mike. Oh, oh it was incredibly complicated, and it's something that's even more complicated that on his nice, uh, he, he wears bell butt bottom tights. He, he, he's reached an age where he can wear bell bottoms, and we can't make fun of that. <laughs> but it has Caesar, S-I-E-S-A-R, ah, calling on it. So there you go. It, it's, it's a weird thing because in, like, in the, like, ancient... Rikuyan like language like it's spelt shisa but it's also like the way that's been said and like phonetically spelt throughout it it's turned out to be a lot more similar to as you said like roman caesar and it's something that can be very complicated and if you're looking for fire pro edits of super shisa which is something that i always do when i get a new copy you have to be careful about it mm. uh, another side story uh the first time i ever saw super shisa uh it, it wasn't in dragon gate it was in chikara for king of trios 2011 because he was on Team Dragon Gate with Akira Tozawa and Kagetora. A, and, a great, uh, like, random, what do these guys talk about team? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, there's a promo that they did on YouTube before one of their matches where it's all three guys next to each other, and Tozawa just yells at the camera, What's up, buddy? We are Team Dragon Gate, Super Shisa, Kagetora, and Tozawa! And, and you're right, looking at them, it's an odd collection of guys with just loud blonde Tozawa, Shisa in the mask, and just straight-laced Kagetora. And I believe they beat the Spectral Envoy on night one, and uh, then lost to the Assyrian Portal on night two. So there you go. Yeah, and it's one of those things that Shisa is someone that was always somewhat in the background of Dragon Gate, so the fact that he came over to King of Trios, and the same thing kind of with Kagetora, when you think about it. And they were they visited at the same time that, that Akira Tozawa had what... I argue is one of the most impactful uh, excursions of all time and where he kind of learned how to be a complete psychopath and become charming at the same time. <laughs> so I, I think I, it's something that like saying like, cause I remember like, it was like super Caesar. She's a, oh, you see, I did it myself <laughs> <laughs> and, and, like, like, in the ECW arena in, 
2011, like if you're going to ask me a list of things to expect in 2011, that would be something that I'd be asking, uh, what are you on at that point if you're proposing? <laughs> but at the same time, it's awesome because he's such a special wrestler and he's one of the guys that, as I've gotten older and the more of like, like the deeper my Dragon Gate and Dragon Spin fan has been, whenever I like I see him and it's just like the things of, oh, I want to see so-and-so versus Shisa. Like one of my favorite matches from last year was when Martin Kirby came over to Dragon Gate and then... And in Prime Zone, that, that little series I was talking about before, they had a match in front of like 60 people in Kobe, Japan, where it was just them grappling. And it was like European style versus Mexican Yaveo style. And it was a really cool thing. He's just a special guy. And it's something that you don't see too much in wrestling. And I'm glad that you chose this track. So we got a chance to talk about one of those unsung heroes, especially in Dragon Gate. Right, right. Um, that King of Trios, by the way, was also the first time I ever saw Tozawa, um, you know, before he became a ninja. <laughs> Uh, Ugh, god damn it god damn it i mean come I, on i have a forever countdown that i've saved for <laughs> akira tozawa my favorite wrestler of this era and my the, the wrestler that i've had like the most emotional attachment to each time where like i hear like oh no he's like where you have to, i have to restart my countdown until when he might come home one day baby one day just gotta just gotta hold on hope hold on hope our second to last wrestler on the list here is the artist formerly known as cyber kong Takashi Yoshida, another member of R.E.D. But you know what? He'll always be Cyber Kong in my heart, Mike. I, I, I can't lie. You know, it's still hard for me to see him without the mask, without the name, without the body paint. It, it's not been easy. Oh, oh I mean, the, the second he started phasing out the pineapple tearing and the, and the body paint, and then now he's without a mask, it's, it, it, it's such a stark contrast to one of the original beef boys of Dragon Gate. Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. <laughs> Forever in a day. Forever in a day. <laughs> in a day. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Yoshida's theme is by Shingo Kawanishi, who also did Don Fuji's theme, Wild Drank Husky, which we covered last time. So there you go. This is called Pineapple Bomber. <laughs> I'm a bit proud of myself here with the song order, Mike, because with some of these themes, we're able to compare and contrast with what came before them, you know, back to back. We just had the Super Shisa theme, which is nice, poppy, easygoing, lovely. Meanwhile, you've got the Cyber Kong theme, which is, holy shit, the robots have declared war on humans. <laughs> you know, there, there is this evil metal music. There's alarms going off and all these beeps and buzzes, metallic clanging, high-pitched keyboard stabbing. Da, 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 da. It's such a sharp contrast with what came before it. it. But as far as the theme for this guy, Mike Cyber Kong, it's a damn good fit. Oh, I could not imagine him changing his theme away from it at this point. Even though he's going back, he's lost the mask. He's no longer the original Muscle Beast. He's now just he he now has like a. Uh, muzzle that he comes out with and a chain and he made names moves after being in the champion carnival he can't change the theme though because it's so much like a like a kaiju movie very much like a kaiju kind of like just like dun 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 and you hear like the, the klaxons going off and it fits him so well just across the board that when you're someone that's been around now i mean he's 37 now his birthday is a couple days after mine i feel like I feel like the two of us should send cards to each other, <laughs> but uh, it, it I, I can't see anything else with it, and it's something that's kind of fitting for a guy who's had such a, a unique way of entering pro wrestling and one that was a, a path not often taken, that he would have such like a very, at least to me, I feel like this is an iconic thing, like I can't see him 
with anything else. It's chaos. It, it, it is audio chaos. And there's no levity. There's no break. It's just crashing on top of you from the get-go. And there are no vocals either. All about the music. And I do give credit to Shingo Kawanishi here for really capturing the essence of Cyber Kong with this theme, both in terms of his wrestling style, his, his meanness, because this is not a fun song at all. You know, Ben K's theme, as aggressive and shouty as it is, can still be a, a fun, heroic anthem. This is not that at all. It is just as nasty and mean as Cyber Kong is. And as well, it does a good job of capturing the, uh, you know, cyber aspect too, Mike. Well, the cyber element is something that was kind of like added to his name. And they've kind of also, they've had various cyber wrestlers in Dragon Gate, which is something that that, that you probably, that people are like, oh, why is it cyber thing? There used to be a wrestler uh, by the name of Baby Slim, who when Dragon Gate first brought uh, foreigners over, he came in and they had him wrestle as Cyber Gang, which is not necessarily the most appropriate thing, especially in 2020. But at the time, like they like had a tag team that the two of them were. And it, it's something like you talk about Ben K's theme. Ben K's theme, you could very easily like see like an animation or just like a video clip or music video of him standing on a, on a cliff's edge looking out as like the sunset. This theme, the one thing you at least I think of like what montage would be would be him breaking out of the lab, like cyber Kong Takashi Yoshida tearing out of like this lab that like, he's like this, it's this like engineered like creature in a lot of ways. And it very much kind of like fits him, especially as he's gotten older and has gotten a little bit more of a madman and not just like a focused muscle beast. Now he's just a crazy person. He would be the person breaking out of the, uh, the testing lab and it fits him so well in that regard. He's going towards the pineapples. Somebody stop him. Somebody stop him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, he used to, like, spit pineapple juice in people's faces. He would bite out the pineapple and spit it at people. Yeah, that's why it's and... called Pineapple Bomber. You know, it's named after, of course, the move Pineapple Bomber, which is a takeoff of Shingo's Pumping Bomber. And uh, the reason they chose pineapple is because he would rip up pineapples and spit them around, which is kind of an odd choice for, like, a cyber monster gimmick, right? And it's something that he is not a trueborn. He was actually found in America. When there used to be the original New Japan Dojo in LA, the Noki Dojo, he tried out there because he was already in the States because he was a uh, arm wrestler, of all things, which is kind of wild. And then he ended up meeting Shingo Takagi, who was on excursion. Like, if you look up Takashi Yoshida in Cage Match or for, like, results in the SoCal area, there is, like, 2004 matches with Takashi Yoshida but he was found here, and he already kind of had this Cyber Kong gimmick before he came over. So I, I would love to like understand like his development of this because, as you said, like pineapples with being a with being cyber, like being like Cyber Kong. Like there's a lot of things that are in play here that I don't know if necessarily anyone ever found out the true story behind all of that. Now, like with the Big R theme, this is an older version of the song because the one he has now as Yoshida is called Pineapple Bomber. Beast is Coming. And that one does have vocals. Um, I couldn't find it online anywhere, but I was able to get the lyrics here. Beast is coming. Have a sea of blood. Beast is coming. Lost is the darkness. Fear it comes. The last time has coming. Hell thrust. Destruction. No mercy. Destroy. Cyberbomb. Destruction. No mercy. Destroy. Rounding shut up. And that about sums it up nicely, I think, Mike. <laughs> well, I mean, he's a guy who loves shouting out shut up in matches. So it makes sense that he would have that in there. And yeah, couldn't you like see, hear like a choir sing these lyrics if like somehow he was like exposed to radiation, becomes 50 feet tall and starts like reenacting the video game Rampage? Beast is coming. Beast oh, absolutely. is coming. Yeah. Destruction, no mercy, destroy, cyber bomb. Yeah, it, it works for sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder what a cyber bomb to a skyscraper would look like. We can only dream. We can only dream. So, uh, so the final theme of the episode here is for another very prominent foreign wrestler in Dragon Gate history. And I stress very because much like with Ricochet, he really grew up. He really grew up and made a name for himself in Dragon Gate and had a lot of success too. Former Dream Gate champion, uh, still the longest reigning Brave Gate champion of all time, and a former member of R.E.D., it's Pac. And uh, back in the day, Pac was a fresh-faced young lad from Newcastle upon Tyne, England. His theme song is by a band called Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. 
Great name, by the way. It's called Evolution, Entering the New World, Pack Remix. So there's really no better way to describe this than just insane, crazy fast techno music, right? I mean, that's it here. It's just high adrenaline, high stakes, mile a minute techno music from the jump. The way I see it, again, comparing and contrasting, it's like the White Lodge version of the Cyberconk theme. <laughs> because the Cyberconk theme is all about chaotic destruction and gloom and doom and, and Garmin Bosia. Pax theme is also chaotic, in a sense, but it's a chaotic good that feels like it's soaring up towards the sky rather than rampaging on the ground. And if you go back and watch Young Pack, especially pre-heel turn Pack, aerial chaotic good is a pretty apt description for this guy, Mike. Yeah, and especially with like how he was before he went to WWE, where he was basically tied to the waist by either Masato Yoshino and Dragon Kid, two guys who, I mean, Dragon Kid never really has been a heel. In Dragon Gate, he's never been a heel. There was, like, a short, like, quick time that with Blood Warriors that he looked like he was going to go heel, but they quickly pulled him out of it because it didn't work. And then Masato Yoshino, who sadly is retiring this year, he's been a face ever since World 1 was created. And this was the f World 1, the first unit that Pac had in. And this is very kind of chaotic in a way that is also fits World 1 with the uh, all-for-one all world, world 1 theme. That it's very much like it's a chaotic, fast-paced theme that works both, that works in it kind of like, almost like a, like if you like pair these themes up, I feel like you get a very similar mood between them. And it, it's such an interesting theme, especially because when he came back as a member of R.E.D. and became the Dreamgate champion, and he clearly said, like, I, I, I was, when I was here, I was a boy, now I'm a man. Did not return to this theme whatsoever. He used uh, Delight Extra Realized, the R.E.D. theme, the, his, entol, his entire second tenure in Dragon Gate. So this very much like encapsulated who he was and where he was in his career at that time. Right. I mean, at this point, he's not the bastard. You know, he, he's the man that gravity forgot. And of course, his music will reflect that. But also the vocals and the lyrics reflect that too. Uh, the vocals are really high-pitched and heavily processed, have kind of an otherworldly, almost angelic quality to them. Uh, the song talks about all these, you know, romantic, melodramatic ideals. We feel the power flowing through us. Why are we so scared? We're not alone. Free your emotions and scream from your heart. It rouses now. Feel that you're alive, etc., etc. Sure, it's not specifically about Pack, but still, it's about having this untapped power inside of you and using your emotions to access that power and feeling alive and feeling like you're soaring above into this whole new world. And Pac is someone who, back in the day, as a rising star, had so much potential and power and talent inside of him just waiting to be harnessed and waiting to be molded into something amazing, Mike. Yeah, and like another like lyric of his that I find in this song that is very much like fits him and where he was at the time is is part of the second verse where like the backing vocal went, Our heart has been united as one, no one can stop us. And it's something that very much like embodies how he was in a lot of ways because for like we talked about ricochet as he was the standard bearer for so long but in a lot of ways pack was ricochet first like as you mentioned longest tenured brave gate champion he was just like 
considered probably even more so than Matt Seidel or Jack Evans, like the first real Western wrestler in Dragon Gate. And very much is like someone who like views the promotion like so highly and sees that as a home that when he returned to the, when he left WWE and before AEW was a thing, everyone's like, oh, he's going to go to like New Japan. But people who knew of him and knew like his relationship there and like followed him there, it's like, no, he's going to come home. And he ended up coming home like the first night, which ended up being actually, funny enough, the last ever Korokin for Shingo Takagi and Dragon Gate. So it's kind of a little bit of synchronicity there. One guy leaves, one guy returns. It, it's, you know, the, the circle of life, as they say. Um, you mentioned the background secondary vocals. Um, as opposed to the main high-pitched vocals, these are really screamo, angry, like death metal vocals. And this may just be my, you know, English major bullshit talking here, <laughs> but maybe that represents this underlying rage and menace inside Pac as well. And as you just talked about here, Pac and R.E.D., no longer the fresh, exciting young babyface. Now he's a rotten bastard. And so there's a little foreshadowing here, unintentional, mind you, but still a little peek at who Pac would become later on. Oh, yeah, no, you could totally like see this. And uh, as someone who's gone to film school, I totally understand being on the English major bullshit here because there's a lot of symbolism here that I could probably write about how the, like, the inner voice of him eventually like takes over by then and end of the theme i mean when like it first starts it talks about now is the time for me to carry out the promise the light of hope suddenly shine and then towards the end of it, it says don't be so scared we are not alone scream from your heart you could see like the voice in his head from the beginning of his career was very hopeful if you want to read this in the song but in this song is basically is i'm going to break out and just destroy everything i'm going to scream out from my heart and it, it's very fitting that like the, the idea of someone evolving no pun intended there <laughs> but so someone who like is who, who like went to dragon gate i i think he was in his i mean he was certainly in his early 20s he was and he was basically a kid who got discovered and they're like oh no you're great we could you, you you will make sense here and absolutely did and then coming back i mean it, it's something that for him he's 33 now which wow that makes me feel old but uh and it went to Dragon Gate in 2007 and then came back in 2019 or 2018, tail end 2018, and completely kind of like changed it. I mean, think about like 2007, 21 to 31. Like, I mean, that's like definitely a huge change in life. And he's definitely someone that through his time in WWE, we definitely saw like the change in him and the change in priorities. And then, you know, you finally break out. You're finally able to leave a place that you weren't happy at. Where do you want to go? You want to go home. So he returned. He returned a rotten bastard. And I think he's all the better for it. You know, he, he may be a bastard for sure, but right now he is a complete package of a wrestler. Not just the young flippy do guy anymore. He can still do the flips, don't get me wrong, but now he can do big power moves. He can do grappling and submission work. He can talk. I mean, this guy is just amazing on the mic right now with his promos and his banter. And as far as him getting older is concerned, still only 33 years old. I mean, these are the prime years. You know, this is when guys put all the pieces together. And unfortunately, right now he's stuck in the UK because of the travel restrictions. So he can't wrestle right now. But I'm 100% confident that when those bans are lifted and he can come back to AEW... He'll come back just as strong as ever. Uh, maybe even stronger because of how angry he is at being put on the shelf again for that long. So uh, I cannot wait for that to happen, Mike. Oh, yeah. No, he was someone that, at least in my books, I thought that for the time period he was in Dragon Gate, no one did more in a short period of time. Because when he came in, this was right after the whole Stronghearts departure. It was right after the Shingo departure. I mean, they crossed paths very briefly. And in a lot of ways... He had a title reign as the Dreamgate champion, the second ever Westerner champion, that set up the company for what the remaining, like, what the 20th anniversary was going to be, the 21st anniversary would be. And he was so, like, on point there. And then in AEW, I feel like that he, him with the Lucha Brothers and Death Triangle is one of the more interesting things in wrestling that there might not be someone I miss more in wrestling at this very moment than Pac on my TV screen every Wednesday. It's because he's like, I know Joe Lanza said this, but no one gets themselves as a character as much as the Ben Slyerly slash Pack gets his character. 
and it's incredible and something that I feel like is direly missed right now. Yeah, I mean, I was all in, no pun intended, on Death Triangle from the get-go. I was so excited for that trio because I love all those guys. And then COVID hit and just the handbrake was pulled. But look, this will not last forever. Things will return to normalcy eventually. And I cannot wait until Pack is back on my TV every week going, Listen up, scumbags! To the audience. It's going to be really good. And he also has one of the more underrated Twitter accounts as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm well, back, you shits. <laughs> when he left WWE. <laughs> yeah. Just one of like, the incredible things. And one of the moments, and they only did this really once, the uh, the uh, Dragon Gates announces when, like, he, like, after the uh, title match and they came out, there was, like, this great, like, kind of hush on a cork and show where, like, R.E.D. was coming out in order. And, of course, Pac being the champion, he came out last. And they kind of went, oh, bastard pack and it's just like <laughs> that was an incredible moment and i was like oh we need to keep that up here and it's direly missed and i really hope that as we get past the summer and hopefully things loosen up and everything is kind of veering back more towards normal that we get more of pack and just like we talked about earlier about the team dragon gate and the 2011 king of trios i want to know what penta el cero m and uh, packs talk about because that has to be maybe the most evil conversations ever. Like those are <laughs> those are two men who will try to take over the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Music of the Mat. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, Mike, thank you so, so much for being here again. Uh, you are, in my opinion, you and Case Lowe, uh, John Carroll as well. You guys are the go-to guys when it comes to Dragon Gate and Dragon System information. And you're not just a knowledgeable man. You're a lovely pal, a great guest, so I'm glad we could have you on again just to have some fun, talk some Dragon Gate, and uh, play some cool music. Yeah, it was an absolute blast, Andrew. The pleasure is mine, and you know, this is it's always a fun thing to look back at a uh, at a company that has like certain themes that goes like on here, and a lot of themes that I feel like might not necessarily rise to the top of people's heads when they think of like great theme music, but especially with like the eight you chose here and then talking about the guys and talking about like these important figures. I thoroughly have enjoyed it and I hopefully can be back again, maybe do episode three this time next year. Yeah, definitely volume three for sure. Um, I was also thinking about a different type of episode focusing on a particular unit made up entirely of millennials. Oh, jeez, Another great stable of themes that talk about just a lot of great things. I mean, talking about, Santa Maria walk there and overdrive the Mirage. Great theme music there. And, you know, a lot of different stuff that we got a chance to talk about today that it was my pleasure to be. So to be with you writing co-pilot on this journey. For sure. For sure. Um, any plugs you want to give? Go right ahead. Uh, well, you could find me on Twitter at Fujiheya, as Andrew said earlier on the show. I co-host two podcasts on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. The first one and the one we've kind of talked about kind of the most is open the voice gate which is me and case low we're right now doing a series where we're going through every single dragon gate usa show <laughs> that ever happened somehow we've managed to go from 2009 into 2011 and two and a half months so we're, we're doing pretty good at this here but we're about to reach a time that it's going to get a little harried and then we try to keep everyone as up to date as the comings and goings right now in japan with dragon gate as well and then as well the other podcast i'm a part of which also kind of in a weird way might be dragon system or not i don't think we've ever really truly decided if it is or isn't but it's called everything elite you can follow that on twitter at everything aew it's myself aaron bentley and nate aka epitasis trying to deliver the best all elite wrestling adjacent content possible so check out me at fujiheya then the podcast at open voice gate and at everything aew and again thank you so much for having me on again Oh, you're welcome. Of course, of course. And Music of the Mat is also part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. You can find other great podcasts on there at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Mat. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. Check out the VOW Discord at VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord. If you want to donate to the show um, or open the voice gate or everything elite, you can do that at VoicesOfWrestling.com slash donate and click the donate button beneath the names of each podcast. If you do donate, hey, thanks so much. You're great. And finally, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. 
Uh, Mike, thank you again, and I'll see you around. Yep, thank you. All right, for Mike Spears, I'm Andrew Rich, and I'll see you next time on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys. Music of the Mat is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders.